Hello everybody and welcome to the Amazon Basin. I am here in a small lake in the middle of a palm swamp in southern Peru, uh, surrounded by some of the most intense biodiversity on the planet. And I've been here for a couple weeks and being surrounded by all this life and different species, it has me thinking about sort of the why save nature question, which is an important part and probably one of the most important questions in conservation and environmentalism. And so I thought what I should do is put together a video kind of exploring that question, maybe from some different, down some different philosophical pathways about why saved nature, using examples here from the Amazon in Peru. Deep in the Amazon rainforest lives a giant, one of the world's mightiest trees, the Brazil nut. Reaching a height of 60 meters, they can reach above other trees in the canopy and soak up the tropical sun. These trees depend on their seeds being in just the right place to take advantage when an old tree falls, and being able to slowly grow and fill in the spot among the more short-lived species that use the temporary light hitting the forest floor to grow and reproduce. However, even after battling against all these other plants and claiming a spot in the rainforest skyline, Brazil nuts are not indestructible and fall prey to the formidable strangler fig, a tree that is deposited as a seed high in the branches of a host by a bird or monkey and then slowly grows over and strangles the other tree, which rots out leaving a hollow in a massive fig that has successfully stolen a spot in the sun. All the time during this saga of the trees, they are taking water, CO2, and energy from the sun to build sugars and release oxygen. Oxygen is critical for the respiration of most life, particularly animals such as humans. Thus, protecting these trees is, in effect, protecting humanity. This line of thinking is a form of the philosophical ideology of utilitarianism, particularly one that is primarily anthropocentric, as the reason for protecting the forest is purely for the good the oxygen waste of photosynthesis does for humans. Our lives would be worse without it, if we had lives at all. The good nature does for humanity is also called an ecosystem service, and while these services can be experienced goods that are hard to quantify, which we will talk about in a minute, often when talking about ecosystem services, more basic essential needs and economic benefits are discussed. The trees in the Amazon do several important services for humanity. They produce oxygen, they take up carbon dioxide, which tries to fix our whole anthropogenic climate change thing, create much of the rainwater in Amazonia through transpiration, Brazil nuts are edible and harvested mostly from wild trees in the Amazon, so next time you see them at the supermarket around the holidays, think about that. The oil from these nuts are also a raw material in clocks, paint, and cosmetics. Going a little more into the realm of experience goods, they are also pretty inspirational. A mighty Brazil nut or fig is a beautiful sight to behold, enough to inspire me to use them in this example, which means they now have an educational service to you. That's seven whole services these trees are doing without me thinking very hard. So there we go. We now know how to save nature. Well, not exactly. This line of thinking is rather narrow, and while it can be convincing and useful, it is pretty shallow and values only what ecosystems and species can do for us, and ignores a lot of the complex ecology of the biosphere. The sun sets over the vast Amazon rainforest. With night fast approaching, diurnal species need to find a place to rest. A pair of macaws are flying to a favorite roost, their loud calls echoing above the canopy. During the day, macaws forage on the nuts and seeds of canopy trees, using their powerful beaks to easily access the nutritious food. Whether foraging or flying to a suitable roost, macaws almost always travel in pairs with the mate they stay with for life, the bond between these two birds being nearly unbreakable. Unfortunately, these birds are under threat because of the global trade in parrots that is still sometimes supplied by illegal captures of wild birds that not only does harm to the population, but to the individual birds. They require the same kind of attention their typical life partners give them, always traveling together and require a lot of space. These birds fly great distances in the wild, 
which is something not every captive individual is able to do. Even getting to a place where they could be bought and sold is difficult, as the illegal trade has deplorable conditions with birds packed into cages, with most not surviving the journey. This is causing pain to these beautiful and intelligent animals, which is just wrong. Here we are expanding utilitarian thinking to take into consideration the pain and suffering of other species, because a good environmentalist wants to move beyond the speciesist anthropocentrism that runs rampant in the world. While the name utilitarianism makes you think about utility and thus sounds like it would only deal in things with utility having value, utilitarian thought, if looked at with toddler level simplicity, is more about saying things that increase happiness are good and things that cause suffering are bad. It is more complex than this, but I am a biologist, not a philosopher. The consequences of capturing wild macaws for the pet trade is the bird gets ripped away from their mate which they may have had years of raising young together and bonding, nearly dies in a cage with a bunch of other macaws in some dark corner of a shipping container filled with soybeans or rugs to avoid being detected by the authorities, and then ends up in some dingy apartment in Milwaukee with someone who works a 9 to 5 who cannot give the time to support the social needs of the bird, and so the parrot becomes depressed, starts compulsive feather plucking, and then has this pretty crummy existence for several decades. That sounds like suffering to me. You don't want this hypothetical macaw that probably exists to suffer, do you? I feel like to some, this is pretty convincing, however we are still limited. You might be able to get some, maybe most people, to agree that this is bad, and macaws should be left free to fly about in the rainforest. But could you convince many people the same about killing and encasing a bullet ant in resin to sell to tourists? Or cutting down a tree? Maybe the ant, but trees are so radically different, it isn't like they have a brain that can perceive the pain of a chainsaw digging into the trunk, which potentially creates limits to utilitarian arguments in environmentalism. The Amazon rainforest is the single most biodiverse place on Earth. One in ten species found on this planet is native to the Amazon basin. One of the most spectacular groups here are the butterflies. There is a dazzling diversity of Amazonian lepidopterans. Some are more camouflaged, having evolved to look indistinguishable from fallen leaves. Others, like this Retus, looks like a five-year-old colored them in with ultramarine, pink, and zebra stripes all clashing on a single wing. However, there is collusion among the insects that flutter about the rainforest. This is a Heliconius butterfly. They are rather unusual butterflies, not only feeding on nectar, but also pollen, as this one is doing. This species is the Sara longwing, which lays their eggs on toxic passion vines. The caterpillars sequester these toxins and become poisonous themselves, a trait the adult butterflies retain. This makes them unpalatable, and keeps a butterfly hunting bird, like this jacamar, from swooping in for a snack. However, a jacamar must still learn that these butterflies taste bad, so has to at one point sample one. In this case, it makes sense for several species to look similar, so that overall, fewer members of each are taken by naive predators, who learn that butterflies that look like this are not good to eat. This is called Mullerian mimicry, where several toxic species converge on one pattern to share in on knowledge predators learn about organisms with distinctive patterns. One of the famous patterns several species have adopted is the tiger mimicry ring, which is so complex and the patterns so similar I am uncertain of the species or even genus of this butterfly. Heliconius pneumata has many different patterns, and this butterfly kind of looks like some of those patterns. However, the Harmonia tigerwing in Tithoria has a very similar pattern. But there is also deception. Not every butterfly that looks like this is toxic. They have co-opted this pattern to take advantage of all these similar looking species that are unpalatable. These imposters that look like poisonous species are called Batesian mimics. The fact that there are butterflies that are both toxic and non-toxic that look like this is why it is called a mimicry ring. Some aren't even butterflies, but moths that have this pattern. Well, technically all butterflies are moths, but these are non-butterfly moths that have entered into the tiger mimicry ring. No matter if they are a toxic species or not, these are beautiful insects and it would be a shame for them to disappear. The aesthetic value of nature is something we often talk about. I mean, it could be argued the whole national park concept in the United States 
was developed because someone thought a certain landscape was pretty and thus should be preserved. The work of many artists who have done extensive work in national parks has helped contribute to this view of nature as aesthetically pleasing. People protect what they like or see as beautiful and so this is a valid reason to protect nature. However, there are limits to this. One is nature may not necessarily be the most aesthetically pleasing thing. Buildings and cities are carefully designed by architects to follow aesthetic rules that nature simply doesn't follow, or some people may find rolling hills of monoculture pleasant to look at. There was even this theory that humans prefer savanna-like landscapes because we evolved there, though this doesn't actually seem to be the case. I just wanted to bring it up because it was connected to the evolution of human aesthetics and had heard it brought up in the past. But I guess it's good news that we don't want to turn every forest into a savanna due to some deep instinctual urge. Leaving human-altered landscapes, we get into virtual reality and the beautiful worlds crafted by game designers, sometimes making a stunning representation of the natural world more aesthetically pleasing than the nature outside. Beyond landscapes, beautiful artwork may give more aesthetic value than nature. If I pinned a bunch of pretty butterflies in an eye-catching pattern, might that artwork be more aesthetically pleasing than a fluttering insect you glimpse through the leaves? Another issue is that while an aesthetic argument works for protecting something like this spectacular urania, which looks like an iridescent green swallowtail butterfly, but is actually from a non-butterfly lineage of diurnal moths, other animals are less than pleasing to look at. Right, most other insects and arthropods are seen as creepy by the average person, and thus cannot use aesthetic concerns as an impetus for preservation. In addition, while aesthetics can motivate people, Often it is seen as a secondary concern, and so the pursuit of food or raw materials trumps the concern for beautiful landscapes or pretty bugs. I must also note, aesthetic environmentalism is categorically anthropocentric. A troop of capuchins move through the forest searching for food. These are powerfully built monkeys with an omnivorous diet allowing them to take advantage of the rainforest's bounty. They forage alongside a troop of smaller squirrel monkeys, the ruckus of the combined troops scaring insects into flight, which is why several birds follow the monkeys through the forest. Entering a patch of bamboo, the large capuchins break into the core of these giant grasses to get at softer plant material and water. They move on, drawn to a spectacular sight, a fruiting tree emerging from the canopy. Other frugivores congregate here. Spider monkeys swing through the trees at great speed. Pigeons perch in the branches. All the fruit knocked loose falls to the forest floor and has drawn in a flock of pale-winged trumpeters. The capuchins and squirrel monkeys stay here for a time before moving on. The monkeys begin turning to more protein-rich foods, feasting on social insects on high tree branches. But for one monkey, these small morsels are not enough. There are many small nocturnal mammals hiding in the trees, and this monkey has caught a silky anteater, the world's smallest anteater and one of the canopy's most mysterious species. The diverse and complex diet that capuchins feed on requires them to be intelligent problem solvers, and likely much of our own smarts comes from our shared primate heritage and using multiple food resources. We are fascinated with monkeys and other animals intelligent in similar ways to us. Perhaps it is seeing some human-like behaviors in another species and that connects us back to other animals. We are not the only highly intelligent species to roam this planet, and many of those have distinctive languages and cultures not too dissimilar from our own. Viewing other species in this light does beg the question whether they deserve to be extended rights. They have needs, they have wants, they should be allowed to pursue that just as any human should, they should not have to worry about human needs and wants killing or taking that away. This idea, libertarian extension, takes the basic principles of civil liberty, the commitment to equal rights for all members of a community, and extends them to non-human entities. Of course, this is a challenge because expanding who we see as the community that gets equal rights is still an ongoing struggle within our own species. 
Tossing in monkeys, whales, wolves, or even as some argue trees and rocks is perhaps too big of an ask. There is a huge communication barrier between species and so we cannot ask them for specific demands they want. I mean, maybe whales would really like to have a say on foreign trade agreements, but we don't know. At best, we can use our own imaginations and thoughts on the rights of non-humans. One major approach is deep ecology, which basically states animals, plants, and nature in general have value because they exist and thus must be allowed to continue to exist. This is an interesting approach and has some potential, but looking at the history of who gains liberty and how, this would be a difficult struggle. Beyond these schools of thoughts, there are many other reasons proposed to save nature. Conservation is itself a kind of ethic based on sustainable use of the environment by humans, which is probably why we have made some headway, rather than something like deep ecology, because capitalism. You have humanism, which is most noticeable in environmentalism when you hear someone saying, wouldn't it be sad for your grandchildren to live in a world without ocelots or night monkeys? Though there is more to it than that. Some people use faith and spirituality in applied theology as a basis for environmental stewardship. There is also deontology, which feeds well into deep ecology, as this philosophical theory is basically doing what is right to do. Not, say, protecting trees because that is good for climate change mitigation, but because, especially if you view trees as intrinsically valuable through deep ecology, it would be wrong to cut them down. So, why should we save nature? The nice thing is there are many reasons to, and most philosophical reasons for protecting the environment are not mutually exclusive. I want you to quickly think about an animal, a plant, or an ecosystem, and think of at least two reasons to save them. Perhaps from one of the philosophical theories I present in this video, perhaps not. And leave them in the comment section so that it acts as a big repository of reasons to save nature. I also wanted to add that there is a school of thought that thinks asking the why save nature question is the wrong one to ask, as it creates this artificial binary between nature and humanity that doesn't actually exist, and that continuing to perpetuate this is more harmful, thinking of everything as a problem to solve so we can keep on doing what we have been doing, instead of saying we need to find a way to move on and adapt to a new paradigm, as we have already set an extinction event into motion. These are not hypothetical issues we can just solve in a few decades. We need to adjust and adapt today. Anyway, sorry to end on a more dire note, especially since the next episode in this ongoing Fundamentals of Conservation Biology series will be on whether we will all die if the Amazon rainforest collapses, as it probably will in the next few decades. I guess if you enjoyed this video and are waiting for that episode to come out, may I recommend starting at the beginning and working your way back through this series? where I cover threats to the environment, conservation strategies, along with videos taking the discussion of environmentalism and conservation in some less conventional directions.